This conference will now be recorded. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Clueless Day Trading Frank. It is Sunday, uh, April 14th, day before uh, tax day, April 15th tomorrow. Approximately 8.14 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is a strategic uh, weekend webinar like we normally do and uh, should set us up for the coming week uh, and a little bit further out to see what's going on with the markets, prepare ourselves to face uh, everything that happens on a daily basis and set us up to hopefully make some uh, uh, decent money uh, in the financial markets as traders and investors. On that note, full disclosure, this is purely for financial education and not for any solicitation or advice. The session, as you all know, uh, will be recorded, uploaded to the Google YouTube channel, Clueless A Trading YouTube channel. Uh, please subscribe to it so you're notified immediately when anything is posted up, uh, uploaded to the Google channel, YouTube channel. And uh, of course, uh, do pass the word around. There's some fantastic resources there. The videos are extremely powerful uh, and, uh, and, and accurate. And anyone with the internet connection can access that and, and uh, at their own time. Uh, view them, learn something, hopefully join us here at Clueless A Trading as members um, and, and, and benefit themselves. Uh, another quick reminder, as like I always do, our Instagram following is growing nicely. Uh, thanks to many of you who have started following and passing the word around. And uh, uh, we are about to cross over the 500 uh, follower threshold. And that's an important number because that's where the algos start picking up. The Facebook algo algorithms start picking up uh, and, uh, and, sp and and showing it in in, uh, uh, in a more expanded form across Instagram, which as you know, is the fastest growing social platform in the universe. Um, so do uh, uh, do uh, promote uh, uh, the Clueless A Trading Instagram channel, which is primarily for promotional purposes. And of course, a very valuable resource for all our, our members, because I uh, take the time at the end of the day to highlight uh, uh, early evening highlight some of the more powerful trades that we have done uh, uh, through uh, options charts and uh, and that is something uh, very valuable because during the day it gets too busy um, and time consuming so I cannot always put out the options charts I certainly put out the real-time charts for my traders on the trades that we're doing but the options charts are highlighted on the Clueless A Trading YouTube channel so keep that in mind on that note let us begin a couple of broad points as you're looking at two charts of the broader market, the S&P 500, uh, which is not live. The, the E-minis are live. That's what you're looking at here on the daily. Um, and um, so here are the broader points. Number one, uh, we have uh, positive developments again uh, on the U.S.-China trade front. Uh, Secretary Tre Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, who is one of the lead negotiators, mentioned one thing which uh, caught my eye is the fact that the enforcement mechanism, which is the last of the final stages of this negotiation, the enforcement mechanism, whether whether these the, the deal points that are negotiated on are enforced, that both parties, both the United States and China, will equally share in the enforcement mechanism. In other words, the United States will also be liable for breaching any one of any of the enforcement provisions um, uh, uh, that that are put in place, deal provisions that are put in place. Now that's a that, in my opinion, is somewhat of a concession to the Chinese because it's not like us just telling the Chinese, like, look, you got, you guys got to do this, you guys got to do that. They're also saying we're going to keep our side of the bargain, and that, if you look at it from a game theory standpoint, uh, is a uh, big plus. Number two, uh, we have uh, looks like uh, the Brexit delay is continuing, so that is good uh, from a business standpoint because when it comes to business uh, and keeping the politics aside uh, that is a positive for financial companies primarily and industrial companies or so um, that uh, that are looking for a delayed and more of a softer Brexit um, ie the United Kingdom leaving the European Union uh, a hard Brexit would definitely create a little bit of a short-term havoc in the market as I've explained many many times so the Brexit situation being delayed uh, and negotiated on further is a positive. Uh, we have had uh, very powerful earnings on the bank front, uh, as you know. Uh, JP Morgan, which I showed the chart two days prior to the report on on Wednesday, um, I believe, when I showed the chart, and this is what happened. When you, when you look at this, this is a significant breakout. Uh, this is a significant breakout, and you're looking at and look how amazingly it hit uh, the last major sell zone, which was uh, on which was on 
December 4th, 2018, right there. Look at that. So it hit that and then pulled back a little bit. Uh, however, it's a very bullish, uh, 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 bullish engulfing candle. More importantly, if you look at this as a cup, if you look at this as a cup, there's your handle. It moves sideways uh, for uh, for uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine days, and then see you later. Those calls were up approximately anywhere from two to three hundred percent, from a dollar to about four dollars, uh, and that is uh, that was a win for many of our members. And congratulations to you all. So um, so at this point, uh, that uh, started off a major, uh, a, a very positive start uh, to earnings. Uh, and the banks and financials are a major component of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, as well as the S&P 500. And the S&P 500, accordingly, went closed the day, I believe, what, up 270 points or so after an intraday pullback a little bit, which I explained very clearly on the Saturday morning videos that some of you attended. And, um, and I highly suggest that you all look at that. I explained very clearly uh, what something our member, our, our very loyal member, uh, active member, MB, uh, pointed out to me in the uh, earlier part of the day. We looked at it and I explained all that. So I'm not going to reiterate that here on this particular session. Um, so we have Goldman Sachs and Citigroup coming up Monday morning, which is tomorrow, uh, pre-market. So, you know, well, like, hey, every earnings is a toss-up, right? So I hope really, really, fingers crossed, you know, say a prayer that Goldman uh, beats the numbers handily. Uh, expectations are somewhat low, even though the stock has uh, done quite well. Uh, overall, and we have been playing that sporadically. I did mention Goldman about two weeks ago as a buy. So if you look at Goldman and uh, put up the same type of uh, scenario here, I had shown it as an ascending triangle. And Goldman is a major, major market mover like Apple, like Boeing. So let me change the color of this. There we go. So if you want to look at it as a cup, and uh, starting in January, Goldman's actually been trading in a range. Like they say, the longer the base, the higher the move. Um, so we got roughly about 188 uh, to about to about 205. So that's 17 points. So if Goldman does bust a move, you add 17 to this breakout, it might pull a JP Morgan type of move, in which case you're looking at the 220 plus range. It has happened where Goldman's been up six, seven, eight points after earnings in years past, in quarters past. So if we have that, then the market is going to basically rip the heads out of the shorts and uh, and and hit that level that I've been talking about. And all the gurus on Wall Street are finally coming around to it. Uh, read some of the articles that I put out there, which is in the range of that 2920, 2940 on the S&P 500. If you look at the chart itself, and that's why the charts are so, so critically important in not just managing your trades, but but uh, uh, but also making some significant profits because let me remind you all bull markets overall are equally difficult to trade uh, uh, similar to bear markets all right because as the markets move higher and prices are moving higher on some leading stocks traders tend to you know traders tend to get really scared uh you know they're all afraid of heights people are afraid of heights and they just look at the price and they're like oh my god it's up Ten dollars now, you know, can it go higher? Well, put the charts in place, make a determination. It's all about probability. It's all about odds, whether or not it's a higher risk reward ratio. I put a fantastic article, an old one that I found on my iPhone that I had saved, and uh, by Dr. Steenbarger. Uh, does it, what makes you a successful trader? Are you capable of being a successful trader? I believe that everybody is capable of being a successful trader. It is an ongoing learning process, and at one point it clicks. It doesn't mean you're going to get every trade right, even though you have the perfect setup. That's because of volatility in the markets, which we cannot control. But net net consistently, you will get more trades right and manage them better uh, than anyone else out there. So just by looking at prices, you won't get anywhere. I can assure you that. And you know that by now. Uh, it is primarily, you know, you have to put the charts out there and not just the naked chart, but the structured charts that I put out there, they're extremely accurate. So if we do get a real earnings blowout, on the upside, then we're good looking at Goldman here. If we do not get one, then Goldman is basically going to come to the lower end of this uh, of this ascending triangle. And Goldman's conference call is extremely important. So let's say, for example, the stock is down pre-market, uh, and then the conference call starts. It could be one of those big power 
reversal trades that with, we will be uh, that I will be notifying you on if we if I see uh, the technical circumstances to be uh, uh, to be relevant. So saying all that, um, let's take a look at what the downside might be. Now these are extremely powerful catalysts coming up for the start of the week uh, and for um, for a very important week. Good Friday is is, is a holiday. So Friday is a holiday, uh, a market holiday, obviously a national holiday. And uh, so Goldman is looking at 186, worst case scenario, lower end of the rise uh, of this ascending triangle or rising wedge is 194, 194. The upside is somewhere between 214. Goldman closed at around 208. Yeah, it closed at 208 or so. So you could you have a massive downtrend line going all the way back to August of 2018. That downtrend line is right here at 213. I'll take 213 any day. Um, so it is going to be a busy, busy morning. I'll tell you that right now, right now. Fingers crossed. Say a prayer. You always got to have faith. You know, part of uh, the element of successful trading is to say a good prayer. Uh, and uh, and that is uh, that is beyond uh, technical analysis. So this is where we are. So far, it looks good. Ascending triangle broke out a little bit. This is the 200-day moving average, extremely powerful line above 200-day moving average. You're going to see a significant amount of fund managers and stuff who are not in Goldman be forced to buy it. We are the 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 50-day moving average was down here at 197. It broke out over the 50-day moving average on the 2nd of April, and this is where we are. So there's Goldman. The second one is Citigroup, equally, not equally, somewhat important, not as critically important as Goldman, but Citigroup has broken uh, above. It's, uh, there, was your, there was your neckline. Let me make this a little thicker. There you go. So here's your ascending triangle. There you go. And um, it broke over that at 67. And it closed above that. And uh, so upper end of the move is around 69 to 70 plus. Lower end of the move would be a retest of the 50-day moving average of around uh, 64. That's a five-point drop. Um, we are long um, with moderate amounts, as we normally do, as we get into the basket, in, in, when we get the basket of earnings, uh, the, the basket of uh, options going into earnings, best way to play it, the basket strategy. So you don't get blown up on one trade or another, uh, then uh, we are looking, you know, uh, we are basically looking at the upside here or upper end, the second massive neckline right there. That's at 69 or we're looking at this range here. It is possible again that uh, the earnings sometimes can be misread. The algos react very, very quickly. Within seconds, you see the stock down. We have seen that happen a lot when it comes to earnings, the standard procedure. The machines move in nanoseconds, not in minutes. So you could see a pullback here, conference call starts, market starts, and you could see it move higher. So that's, just keep that in mind. That's just the way it works, okay? That's just the way it works. But so far, looks good. So those are the two major ones that are coming out um uh tomorrow morning so uh so bank earnings we have netflix coming on tuesday uh so that's going to be a toss-up and uh, i don't know if i'll have time to explain the whole netflix trade here but netflix fell hard which is actually a good uh before earnings if you look at it that way uh to pick up some stuff maybe tomorrow morning uh because of disney which went the other way disney hasn't had a move like that and god knows how long you know so uh, that's like uh, that's like make you know that that was really something you know Disney up twelve bucks uh, on on uh, on the night before it really wasn't doing anything uh, because they had that major investor day talking about their cheaper streaming service and stuff like that so Netflix Netflix was sold and Disney bought so anyway um, we have uh, um, so those are the you know just to keep things in perspective we have the China stuff we have that. Uh, we have President Trump tweeting again, you know, uh, uh, going hard on uh, uh, on the Fed Chairman Powell. I don't think that's a major 
uh, issue. Markets know that, you know, good old Donald, my New York boy, likes to, you know, talk big on, you know, telling the Fed that if, he, if they didn't do quantitative tightening and raising rates four times last year, that we would be up five to 10,000 points higher on the Dow, which would be fantastic, but not, it wouldn't happen like that. But still, um, that's something to just, you know, keep on the back of your head. No, again, he's not, he's not firing Powell, but he's just saying these things, which is all fine and good. Uh, and that we should have done quantitative easing. Yeah, if we did quantitative easing, that means we were, we were really in the crapper and the markets would not like it one bit. The mar uh, interest rates would fall, mark uh, banks would collapse more, um, which brings me because banks do want slightly higher interest rates and slightly higher interest rates are actually good for the economy. That means companies have pricing power. That means there's demand for money. That's the way you look at it. Slightly higher interest rates mean that there's demand for money. There's no demand for money, then you get negative interest rates like we had in Germany. That's one of the reasons why the markets fell two weeks ago. Remember that? You know, they, they, their government bonds went into negative uh, 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 levels. So that's, you don't want negative interest rates. That's, that's, that's deadly. So you definitely don't want quantitative easing. Easing, you know, quantitative easing was when the uh, the Great Recession happened in 2009. That's when you do quantitative easing. That's what, exactly what they did uh, for for a bunch of years. But uh, after that, no. So anyway, so let's take a look at uh, something that is extremely important. One of the reasons that you don't hear from CNBC, but you'll certainly hear here. One of the reasons why did the market go higher on Friday? Where did a lot of the liquidity come from? Take a guess. A lot of the because in order for markets to go higher. Mom and pop are not the ones driving the market. You and me both know that, right? So there's a lot of cash on the sidelines from hedge funds, mutual funds, pension funds, institutional funds. So that's one of the reasons. But the other part is a lot of the money came from the U.S. Treasury market, U.S. government bond market. So what does that, uh, so how did that happen? Well, this is the way it happened. And I showed this chart before. Look at this chart here. We were, we were moving higher, markets were rallying because when bond deals go higher, that means money's coming out of yields are inversely correlated with price. All right. So when got, when when money's coming out of the safe haven, in this particular case, the ten-year government bond is used as a proxy. When money's coming out of when money's coming out of the bond market, that means that people the the the, the big institutional and the global players are selling safety because bonds are known as safe assets, right? And stocks are known as risk assets. Risk assets. So that's the, re the reason we 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 say uh, uh, risk on, risk off. Risk on means the stocks are going higher. Risk off means bonds prices are going higher. When bond prices are going higher, yields are falling. Like like this happened when bond prices hit rock bottom at 2.356% or 2.35%, you have to move the decimal one to the left. That means a lot of global money, big money, because of all the fears of a European recession, US-China trade war, primarily European slowdown, they went and hit in government, US government bonds, which are the safest assets in the world. That also drove the German Bund, which is their version of the government bond, into negative territory. Because so much money went in and hit into in the safe havens, it sucked money out of the stock market. Remember, there's always a battle between the stock market and the bond market. Who's going to pick up more money? So I want you guys to understand that. Okay. So, so bottom line is the, the opposite is happening right now. Now we are charted, so we're charting it. So I charted this thing and I showed you the big rising uh, falling wedge. So let's say you know nothing about the government bond market, which is fine, which, by the way, is a heck of a lot larger in trillions of dollars than the overall stock market. So the bottom line is that's the debt market um, that, that if you treat this as a if you treat this as a um, falling wedge, well, what happens to falling wedges? MB. What happens to falling wedges? We have played this in many, many times in, in individual stocks. Oh, they pop up. That's right. They pop up. Exactly. Well, if we get a pop up to this level here, please, somebody can, can somebody mute, mute their mic. I'm getting a lot of feedback. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Uh, somebody's got to mute their mic because I'm getting a lot of feedback. Hello? Okay, again, somebody, somebody has not their mic yet. Hello. 
Okay, it's still happening. Okay, somebody did. Thank you. Because then I can't hear anything. All right. So if it pops up, what's the next level it can go to? You know, this, this is the thing that guys in Goldman Sachs maybe get paid $3 million a year to figure out. And for your, you know, small amount of money that you're paying every month, you're getting this for, you know, literally free here. So you look at this line here. This is your mass. This is your big downtrend line. Government bonds can pop up to 2.6%. 2.6% right there. And that would be the falling wedge breakout. And if it really takes off, then you're looking at the same, you know, you chart it the same thing as a stock. Then you get to the top of the neckline. There's one neckline here. This is an inverse head and shoulder within a large macro falling wedges. Macro falling wedges are very powerful technical trading instruments in stocks. And of course, I'm showing you overlaid on the 10 year government bond. So you got the first level here which is around 2.62%, the next level is 2.66%. And in that case, with that, with yields moving up that sharply, yields moved up very sharply on Friday. Look at that. Let me zone in here. Look at that pop. That's like a stock popping hard. Okay, options up like big. So right there, it's attacking the 34 day moving average. And so if it and attacking the upper end or uh, upper arm of the of the uh, uh, rising uh, of the falling wedge. So at this point, there's going to be some resistance. But the 50 day moving average is here at two point seven. So if government bonds break out, as MB correctly pointed out, this is what falling wedges do. We have played a lot of those on stocks pops out like that. A significant amount of money technically will be pushed out of the safe haven which is the 10-year government bond used as a major proxy pushed out where pushed out into the stock market that's going to be another major risk on day which will push the markets higher towards the levels of a retest of the all-time highs on the s p 500 that's in the range of 27 2940 to 2950 around that level so you're looking at another 40 points or so from here multiplied by eight seven eight whatever another 300 to 400 points on the dow before the market takes a real breather put all these things together it's really not that difficult and i know you all of you are getting it so that's really what happened that's one of the reasons where this is one of the primary reasons why so much money came out of the bond market into the market stock market so from bonds b to stocks so despite the fact that we have, you know, certain stocks will do what they do. I'm talking about the overall general market. Banks sucked in a lot of the money because as yields moved higher, yields moved higher, that benefited uh, uh, banks. Because banks cannot sustain themselves with low rates, the level it is, uh, because the demand for money is low and they're not making any money. They need slightly higher rates. They don't need rates up here. In which case the market's going to crash like kingdom come all right we're going to have one of those uh, uh rate tantrums but somewhere in this range is an optimal range for 2.7 percent 2.6 percent uh where the markets are in a very sweet spot for stocks to go higher banks to keep on rising which are the major component of the s p 500 you know the story so always remember when you look at the tnx that's the yield not the price this is the tnx the yield so if the yields are moving higher to a certain degree, um, then that means money is coming out of the bond market into the stock market overall net net. If you're playing the spies, you're going to have a good day. So something, you know, many of you didn't know, but now you know. Now, if you look at it from a slightly longer standpoint, then you are looking at this pattern here, which is the same as this. The Texas bullhorn pattern, also known as a inverse head and shoulder. So, can it get to 2.7 percent? Who knows? Yeah. Okay. So now we're out of the bond. You know, I did have to show this. Now there are two things I want to show to you people, uh, which I wrote down for notes. I don't really, really write notes that much. Everything stays in my head, and then my charts. 
So here is something when people say, well, what do you think the market's going to do? Well, we're talking about playing the overall SPX and the SPIs. S SPIs were up anywhere from 454%. Somebody would say, whoa, really? Yeah, really. Because if you look at the, if somebody played the extreme lottos for Friday expiration on the, on the April 12th, 289 calls, which I had also mentioned, but most of the time, most of them were, we were at the air of or, or next week's calls, April 18, the 289 calls went from on thursday evening they closed at 22 cents they went to a dollar 54 that's beyond 500 percent they went to a dollar 54 if you take a dollar 54 divided by 0.22 that's 600 percent at the top of the market of course they were expiring on friday but they still closed at a buck 28 which was 454 percent higher so if somebody says well I really want to just play for Friday. Well, there was your trade, which also was highlighted. Even the ones that I showed, the S&P 500 2940 call, saying that that's the ultimate target for the S&P 500 going to with the 2940, uh, 2950 level. Those babies went from, and I showed this earlier part of last week, they went from roughly a dollar to $3.41. And ended the day up at at two dollars and thirty cents. Do the math. From ninety five cents on Thursday's close, they went to three forty one. That's five. You know that that's that's like three hundred percent plus. And ended the day at two dollars and thirty cents. These are not expiring till next Friday. These are a good way to play this. The, the uh, they're almost like priced like the spies. So if we do get to twenty nine forty then those things which closed at $2.15 will jump up to 4 or $5 or more, okay? So this is what I wanted to show you guys and just to keep this in mind because we do have to wrap this up very quickly. Game of Thrones premiere, I've been reminded, is starting and I'm sure none of you want to miss that. So I like, you know, so that's good. Uh, so we have... Um, so here is on the S&P weekly that I something that I detected and all of you and these things are important. Why are they important? They're important because this is what keeps you in a trade and not jumping out like monkeys on a hot tin roof every time the market is down 30 points in the middle of the day. So if you look at the if you, if you look at the daily, there is something that happened here on the 12th of February right there which is significant this pretty much told us that we are going to be on an upswing regardless of the fact that we have dropped hundreds of points on certain days and two three four days in a row they were all tactical buying uh, uh and if you look at the chart they were all tactical buying opportunities which i highlighted to you you know i just don't for fun say uptrend intact you know just to keep people happy you know i'm making a determination based on a lot of significant factors including technical factors that i'm looking at and that's when i say uptrend is still intact as long as these major moving averages moving higher um, and, 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 and the lines are crossed and trending higher, the 34, the 50, the 20, the 5, this is the 5-day moving average for very short-term traders, then what's the big deal? You know, so ask yourself that question as we are all trying to improve, as you're all trying to improve your, your trading skills. So something happened here on the 12th and that was a major, major crossover. Didn't happen down from all the way down here. Remember, the rally started the day after Christmas, but the real, but the technical uh, thing where somebody will say, "Oh, is it safe?" Well, from a technical standpoint, that was the, that was ultimate signal. That happened on the twelfth of, um, of of February, where the thirty four crossed over the fifty. Significant. This happens with stocks too. You know, technicals apply to anything, any asset class. That's why they say if you're a technician, they can give you any asset class. You have no idea about it. It's a company you have no idea about. You put all these technicals on top of it, structure the thing, and you can trade it. You don't have to know anything about the company. Nothing. It certainly helps when you know something about the company, but still, technicals precede fundamentals. I didn't make the term up. That's been that's that's a saying on Wall Street for 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 many many years. Technicals will show you the way where to buy, where to sell. The, the fundamentals will tell you whether or not it's a company worth buying or selling. Simple. So this happened on the 12th of February. Now, I noticed this on Friday, and this is certainly uh, something which has to be taken into account. This is the weekly chart of the S&P 500. 
going back to uh, 2018. See, 2018 started here and this one. So where this is what I noticed. There is a crossover of the 50 over the 34 day moving average. And that happened on, look at the date down here. That happened to be precise on the 25th of March, 25th of March, about a, uh, three weeks ago, 25th of March. We have a crossover of the 50 over the 34. The market is in a serious bull market. On the weekly, we have a 3450 crossover. I look back to see when the last time I could see that. Going back five years, the last time we saw, and it's a mild crossover. Okay, I understand that. But still, it's a crossover right there. When was the last time we crossed over the 3450? It happened here. When was that? That was June 27, 2016. Where were we at that time in the S&P? 2021. So think about this for a minute here. And since then, this is what the market's done. You know, when you look at charts like this in the weekly, we, 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 we all wonder like, why the heck didn't we just put everything in there, buy some long dated leaps like a year out and just go away or then just trade with a little bit of amount of money and the bulk of the money stays there, right? Well, in hindsight, everything's 2020 because you didn't expect these type of huge monstrous moves that happen. So we always have to keep an eye on what's happening daily and weekly. Uh, but still, this is significant. This is significant. So and even when we had that huge crash, huge crash, right, in, in, in October, the monster crash, which tested the 50, you know, the 10, the, the multi-year 200-day moving average, this, this, this line, this is critical. And I showed this to you guys. This happened once before in 2016. When? Well, before the elections, February 8, 2016, we, we, we almost kissed the, the rising 200-day moving average. And that's exactly what we did on the 24th, the Christmas Eve massacre, when they just dropped the market 700 points at the close, if you all remember. And we were moderately long. And then we won more long. You don't have too many services that did that. They're all screaming bloody murder and it's all over. Yeah, it ain't all over till it's over, okay? And the story of life and markets are a bull market overall. It has been. When was it? Has the market been on a downtrend for the last 50 years? I mean, look at the stock market for the last 100 years. It's gone nothing but higher. So just think about that for a minute, you know, before you get super bearish um, on everything. So bottom line is, that uh, this, uh, so the, I detected that the last time this happened, just to go back to it, was a crossover that happened. Um, this is never a cross under, but I'm trying to see somewhere in this in, in in this range, we basically crossed over right there around June 27th, right there. So that's pretty significant, okay. And now we are detecting. So when we look back at this chart, let's say six months from now, we're like, holy crap. That's look where we are. And that was that crossover we detected here on this webinar right there. Now, saying all that, let me show you something very, very important. We are getting on a short term basis, extreme overbought. And, and this is the final. This, we were we're in major wave five, right? This is when people start getting that feeling like oh my god i missed everything if i don't cast this move you know i'm never going to make money in the market mom and pop are calling up their mutual fund guys and saying hey move my cash from the money market account into that growth fund that i've been looking at it looks like things are nice very you know things are looking a lot safer now the biggest danger sign so we are in that phase right now just so you know and that phase doesn't end in one day it takes maybe a couple of weeks or maybe a month or two but it's going to end and you're going to get that 2000 point drop. All right. So but this is the FOMO period, right? The fear of missing out. But what I'm in, uh, noticing across the board, because my tentacles are a lot. I, you know, I know the feelings of what my members are doing. I know what my ex-colleagues on Wall Street are doing. Um, and, uh, I know, meaning I can still talk to some of them. And, uh, and, and I know the general feeling coming out of Wall Street, the vibes you get from the media. Everyone's still pretty bearish. Nobody's really bullish. OK, and every little drop in the market is like, here it comes, here it comes. And don't tell me you don't feel the same way. 
But that's why you focus on the chart. You don't need to go crazy bullish. You can do these tactical trades and constantly keep on making some money, some money, and then catch some of the 400 point movers, 400% type of movers. So the point is that, but the look at the general trend. So if you look at it, um, so we are in that stage right now, okay? Um, the FOMO stage, fear of missing out. So technically speaking, upper end of this rising wedge, you can see that is again, the retest of the previous highs. So this is what I wanted to show you from the SPX weekly, uh, the 3450, 325. Um, so that was one thing. The second thing I want to show you, the measured move of where we can go to. And that's, and that is, that is uh, uh, off the median. Now, what is the median? I took the median line as 2018. So 2018, you guys want to just want to, you know, just jot it down with a pencil. Um, 2018 started here, right there. This was like the wave five of 2018. I don't want to get to it, but that's when mom and pop say, yeah, that's it, put everything in the market. Yeah, well, that's what exactly what happens. Look at the size of these candles, right? And then the massacre happened. And since then, at least on, over the past year or two, uh, year or so, Mom and Pop and the average investor, including many of our traders, chat rooms get quiet. Everyone's just running around. Tactical traders are systematically making money. The rest of the world is just like, oh my God, I can't touch this market. Like, oh my God, you know, I'm going to sell it because I'm down 30% on an option, which happens in three seconds. And then in the meantime, next day you wake up, it's up 120%. You're like, oh crap. Well, how many times are you going to say, oh crap to yourself, right? So, well, that's your business, not mine. So, bottom line is, um, since then, money really hasn't really flown into the market, starting to come in, starting to come in. And then they're start, they come in here on these, on these uh, big moves, and then market pulls the fast one, four or five, four or 500 point drops. Everyone just flees again. And then the market just goes its merry way. That is the market. It's not fair. You want fair? Like that saying goes, go to a nice fair. Go to a nice fair in Wisconsin where they have some of the best fairs in the world, right? Uh, go to a circus. You, you know, you want to you want to be a tactical trader, stay here at Clueless Day Trading. All right. Don't 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 expect fairness from the market. Attack the market with your weapons and your weapons are these tactical charts. No question about it. Uh, and your mind. Train your mind. So saying all that, let's look at the median here. Twenty six eighty one. So if we do a measured move from the lows, twenty three forty four, somebody get there. I'm. So 23.44 minus the median line where 2018 started is 26. I'm just rounding off the decimals, 26.82. How many points is that? That's 338 points from here to here. So that's. So if you add 338 points to 2682, sorry, if you add, uh, where's my marker here? So if you, uh, right from here, you add 338 points. It's like a range breakout, right? So here's one range. You broke out of the range, generally speaking, back of the napkin over a multiple period of weeks, maybe a month, a couple of months. You know, this is the weekly chart or sooner than that. Things happen a lot faster. You add it, you add 338 to this range breakout, just the way with stocks. I'm going to show that on Avago too, uh, is, uh, and I've already shown that on Avago on the Twitter feed, is 3020. So the market could hit. 3,020 before this cycle ends. Now, that's one way to look at it. The second way to look at it, you measure the distance traveled or the standard deviation mean reversion from the 50 and the 30 day moving average. I'm sorry, 50, 34 moving average. If you look at it, how many points is that? First is here from the 50. Let's do this. right there 
Here's your 50 day. Let me clean this out. Okay. Here's your 50 day moving average where the market closed, went above the 50 day moving average um, the same day, give or take, when we had that 3450 crossover on the daily. So, what's this number here? 27, 29, 28. Ish. Yeah, I'm, tr I'm trying to, yeah, that's why I'm trying to just get a uh, exact uh, print here. Uh, I can't see the reds. Let's work it white and put four. So 27.32, okay? So 27.32. So what's 23.44? 23.44 minus 27.32. 388. Is 388. Thank you. So 388 points is your that the market traveled roughly and fell. 388 points. 388. So we took the 388. Now, before I go any further, I'll keep this and try to uh, wrap this up soon uh, in a few minutes. Is the fact that, look, we were here. So if somebody says, look how much we have come, the market's going gangbusters, everyone's just crazy, look at this market. Think about it for a minute here. We just barely broke out once, you know, we just broke out in, in the month of, uh, we just broke out in the month of- March and eight, March. Out. Yeah, March. So the, so, real add, ral so, so the real rally really started in March. Right, we if just you add the 388. Yeah, so, so at 2732, you get 3,120. There you go. You did the job for me. So it comes to how much? 3,120. Okay. So now let me show you on a technical basis if this matches. I haven't done this yet. 3,000 what? 120. 120-ish. Uh, so this is the magic of technical analysis. All I did was do a parallel line touching a very important key uh, uh, top where the market fell off, right? And and what's this number? 3,127. So can the market get a 3,127? Now this might not, this might be a year end target. I don't know. We shall see, but it can get there in a hurry. But to get to 3,020, which is right around the corner, but more importantly, what's right around the corner is that 2,940 level. Now remember, if the markets travel, so this is what you call the standard deviation mean. All we did was look to see what the measured move was from when it fell apart, rose, and add that directly to 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 where uh, 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 to to the range breakout. Now, if we break, if you look at the uh, there's there's a third scenario. Now, these are obviously bullish scenarios, but hey, I'm showing looking at a bullish chart. I'm looking at a bullish scenario. We know what the downsides are. We know where where the market can fall and retest the fifty. Uh, the 53450 moving average and all that stuff. We already know that. So saying all that, um, move drawing. Okay. The other way to look at it is this is a massive range. Now this is a multi-year stuff. So I'm not saying this is going to happen overnight. But if you want, if you're still in the extreme bearish camp, which most traders are overall, then consider this for a minute here. This 20 through 50, 2950. That's 600 points, right? Mm -hmm. 2950 and 2350 which was a which was for now a, a pretty generational type of bottom so you at 2950 plus 600 points you're arriving at 3550 so if good old donald's right and there is we don't need quantitative easing they just need to stop raising rates which you already said he said we're not raising rates anymore we can go to we can basically go to 3550 in the s p you don't even know what could happen right there all i did was match the tops and guess what it gets to it gets to 3500 gets Beautiful. to 35 it's unbelievable how these numbers match it's like the time that i showed that uh, uh this was months ago i still have that chart. obviously i archive all my charts by the way if anyone's interested in looking at all the charts i will give access to the dropbox which has every single chart posted on clueless a trading since we started the service on april 15th it's our anniversary on uh, april 15 2014 it's our fifth year anniversary and it's been a phenomenal ride getting to know all of you and uh, thing. And we need to grow it tremendously. The next year or two, we will be a lot bigger, believe me. 
So the bottom line is I had shown the Tesla chart showing the 420 number. And guess what? Good old Elon mentioned 420 as the so-called buyout price during that fiasco with the tweet about the Saudis being, you know, what the funds ready or whatever he said, uh, funding secured. So charts are amazing. Charts are amazing. And um, but in between, it's not going to be a straight line up. I'm just showing you that you could buy a leap maybe four years out. And you'll see it come to fruition. You don't need to trade. You just basically trade with a little amount of money and put most of your money out there. Now, that's only happens if we break out over these levels. Now, one of the things that I wanted to remind everyone, this is a monster, monster, a uh, macro head and shoulder. So if we do break out, you're going to see a significant amount of money that comes into the stock market. And that's going to be beyond wave five. And that's institutional money that's been sitting on the sidelines, not meeting their pension obligation. Remember, pension funds, which are the one of the, the biggest uh, players in the market, they have an obligation. They have to earn six to seven percent from the stock market in order to pay all the pension liabilities. And America's not getting younger. They're getting older. Everybody's pensions are coming due. So where the heck are they going to get the money by sitting in bonds at two percent? Think about that for a minute. So so a bottom line is that uh, a slight higher allocation, and I've mentioned this in the previous video, that the hedge funds and the pension funds are so under position in equities, in stocks, that they even a 1% to 2% allocation higher towards, the, uh, towards individual stocks can drive this market up hundreds of points just because the big elephants are stepping in a little bit further. So just, you know, be aware of that. Now, uh, so that's the, that's so that's your longer term picture that I'm showing you. Now, shorter term, this is what we have to deal with every day. We don't like it that much, but hey, that's the way it goes. Um, we first look at the look at look at what we're looking at right now. One of the things I talked about uh, on the Saturday thing, we were explaining uh, the, 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 the the W pattern, uh, the dragon bullish pattern. And uh, seldom is it this perfect. Most of the times it's like this and everyone freaks out like, oh, my God, you know, the market's just going to hell in the handbasket. You know, you start hearing those pundits, you know, uh, uh, idiots on CNBC. I shouldn't call them idiots because a lot of them are very smart. OK, with all due respect. Uh, but most of them are dead wrong most of the time. So uh, including a bunch of Wall Street big shot analysts and including most people in other trading rooms that you follow. Everyone's like pretty super bearish overall. OK, some guys are bullish. We happen to be quite bullish when things get really rough. Uh, when the, when when it's when it's showing like extreme critical uh, 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 readings on the internals on a short term basis, why the while the monthly, the daily, monthly, and the weeklies are still continuing forward. So that's your real chance to buy. So if we so seldom do they look like this. So if you look at this, I had mentioned this, and you can go look up my charts um, as as a complex head and shoulder. I mean, sorry, complex W. It looked like this. If you believe me. And the ones who acted, they're very happy. They're beyond happy because this was a complex head and shoulder. It wasn't perfect. It was like this. But it was a W. It was a complex head and shoulder. It broke out ferociously. Again, most traders under position. They're not in, in, in the trade. So they're scrambling. As always. So. They, it broke out on the 28th of March, 28th of March. That's when we had that 3450 crossover too that I showed you on the daily. No, on the weekly, yeah. And then this complex head and shoulder morphed into a, and you have to know, you have to learn technicals, okay? So this complex head and shoulder, uh, sorry, complex W, head and shoulders and stuff included too. W pattern became a powerful W, call it a cup, broke out ferociously, created a trading range, broke out, retested, and then broke out Friday. For reasons I've already explained, the banks, the 10-year bond and stuff. So this is what we have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, but if you have nice profits and things, certainly take it. Your market gap opens 10, 15 points. I say, gotta sell the profits. 
and then you can re-enter. But you have to be involved on the long side unless critical levels break. So for com for for tomorrow uh, and the com coming days, if we we are in this acceleration zone right now, see this green, you know. I know by this time a lot of people who refuse to, you know, were stubborn about charts and stuff. They're getting it. They're getting it. So here's your here's your level. If we break below this level, that's why we have this red shaded area here, uh, uh, which is around 28.94 or so on a short-term intraday basis. There's a possibility that we'll come and retest these red lines here, but that doesn't mean you can go to bed with a massive spy put because that's going to kill you. Intraday, you want to do some quick spy puts and stuff? Sure, no problem. So saying all that, let's take a look at, and this this is still a one-hour chart, so it's mostly for short-term uh, day traders and swing traders. This is your large acceleration channel that the market, in my opinion, given favorable bank earnings, given some other favorable climate that is happening across the board, on the economic front, as well as um, um, as well as on the on the U.S.-China trade deal front, this is the ultimate short squeeze zone that basically takes us into the echelon of the 2900s. Look at that, this 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 level here. Now markets are in the business of shocking traders and investors. There could be a shock move higher because nobody believes it can happen. None of you really truly believe that this can happen. I don't even truly believe this can happen. So that's why it's most probably going to happen. Well, we're going to hit 3,000. Now, this is your big uptrend line that the market was traveling all the way since the end of March. Let's not be in denial. We fell below it, and now we are in this zone here, right? This in between this green line these two green lines right there right there if we break out over this with one one of these big fat green candles what we call a breath thrust just like that we are going to be attacking and attempting to re-enter this broad uptrend channel which is the scariest thing ever for dogmatic hedge funds and two sigma type of funds those guys are going to sue me for mentioning their names too often. They're big, uh, who constantly overall stay bearish on the markets. I don't know what their positioning is right now, but that's overall what they are. The two sigma fund. Look them up. Okay? Billions of dollars get squeezed. And if this happens, big fat green candle, like in another three, 400 point move, like the market opens up like that. China trade deal, back to back good earnings. It can propel it automatically their machines short cover short cover it all starts overnight in few in the in the globex futures markets and it's not just two sigma there are so many european shorts in our markets you know foreign investors overall i listen to bloomberg all the time you know um these big shot analysts you know from credit suisse and bnp paribas and swiss banks and stuff they're like well yes the global slowdown and blah 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 okay i got it when tell me something i don't know okay what happens in life after something slows down it's nowhere to go but speed up that's the reason why the central banks refusing to raise rates across the world and injecting liquidity to promote growth so if this happens what can i say now nothing's easy you, you, you know, this could move here and then fall back to 2,900. The 2,900 reset is something that is standard procedure. can happen within 15 to 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. In other words, the markets can pull back 10, 15, 20 S&P handles. That's anywhere from 100 to 150 points. No worries. It doesn't change the structure of where it wants to go to. It changed the structure where it wants to go to if we break below 2850. That's the reason why you have to monitor these charts. Somebody, uh, MB mentioned anyone trading NVIDIA, there's a huge block trade on Friday afternoon, 1.4 million at 190.76. There you go. So there you go. That's your, this is, these are the ultimate trading charts. So even if you were never a trader, want to learn about the market, that few dollars you pay every month, this is worth it. This one session is worth it. Let's look at um, let's look at the 15 minute. This is your 15 minute chart. 
This is something I follow. This is something that I uh, uh, trade uh, my intraday trades. I do this, you know, I obviously I follow it big time. So I talked about this. This is the month of April. I showed you these inverse head and shoulders within this big macro channel. The upper end of the macro channel is 29.20. That's the short term target. That could be hit by tomorrow morning on a good earnings from Goldman and City. Right? So what happens when we hit the upper end of the channel? Automatic sell programs come in. So if you're up nicely and you're seeing it getting close to it, you don't have to wait for it to touch it. It doesn't always touch it before the sell programs come in. But right there it is. Now I drew a megaphone on top of it. That megaphone goes all the way to 2940. That's on the that would be on a major breakout over this channel. Then all of a sudden, this is this is the bear kill zone. You know what bear kill zone? It's like free hunting zone. You shoot every bear that comes along your way. That means the shorts die. That's when you guys, a lot of you, are like, "Oh my God, I should have been long. I should have bought those calls, man. I keep I can't keep on doing this. The market hates me. The market doesn't give a shit about you. Excuse me. They don't give a crap about me." So stop thinking you're that special that the market is looking after you unless you're a million dollar player and you're putting half a million dollar trades on the on the spies and SPX. Then the market does look at you. The algos do look at you. But aside from that, no one cares. So don't feel that special that the market's watching you. The only person watching you are the demons in your head keeping you away from making solid profits on multiple trades, not just the SPIs, the SPXs, IWMs, QQQs, DIAs, in a lot of stocks too. So contain the demons in your head, and I think you'll be a much better trader. I tell myself that. Everyone's got demons in their head. Your past controls you. Your past sucked because you never made money. So your past is constantly telling you, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't get in that trade. No, 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 this is it. This is it. You're too late. So psychologically, the only way, you, you just can't wake up one morning and say your demons are gone. You need to kill the demons in your head when you're trading by trading charts. I don't know how many times I have to say this. I say this to myself all the time. Only way you can control your emotions is by becoming somewhat of a tactical trader. No one becomes a 100% tactical trader. Nobody. Because it's real money involved. When we're down 30%, 40% on an intraday move down, yeah, it doesn't feel good. But doesn't mean you have to panic and give away everything to the, to the machines who love, who would love to take that away from you and make a crap load of money just every single time they've done that. That's the reason why these charts will save your butt. Not only that, make you money. So this is your day trading uh, and swing trading charts if you want to look at it that way. So this is your channel. What's the next one? The next one is the actual S&P 500. That, by the way, is a real-time chart right now. Features are down about two, standard procedure. This is where we are. This is your range that we broke out of, 2904. Now, these are the E-minis. doesn't matter. They are the proxy for the overall market. So this was the range right there, lower end of the range right here. That's a very wide range. You don't want to go to 2871 from 2900 and just sit there and say, oh, everything's okay. If it hits this range, you want to minimize, like I said, the best way to do it, if you don't want to completely bail out and take a loss, you minimize your long exposure. If you have four cheap calls, go down to two. If it comes down here and everything, all, I'm not showing the internals here, get severely overbought. I'm showing those serious overbought, oversold conditions on the stochastics and stuff. Okay, you buy those two that you sold at a cheaper price and buy a little bit more to lower your cost average because the next thing that'll happen this is a 2900 you know range top uh, uh thing lower megaphone retest whatever you call it because that's the that's the range right well this is the channel range and this is the range for the overall this so so even if it falls here 29.84, that's the 410, that's 14 points times eight. Yeah, that's like a 110 point drop. Then what did they do? This is where the rally started, by the way, at, um, at around 3.45. Well, that's 3.45 in the morning. Um, the market started at 10.30, 9.30. The market started 9.30, pulled back, retested this range. That was a big pullback. In the middle of the day not didn't go negative but we just went boom 
and then retested it. See you later. So why why can't it retest it? Might do it overnight. I want things to do it overnight. Where futures are down 15 points overnight because that means the retests are done overnight in the Globex futures, and you're good to buy. So even if it slips below here, it's going to move this way, in my opinion. Depending on the overall conditions, what the earnings are from Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, what the general news flow coming out of the US-China trade talks, Brexit news, European news, that type of stuff. Some Fed speaker, they can move markets too. So that so this is your this is the chart that you follow in order to see where to buy, where to sell. But then you don't even have to worry about that because I'm the one putting out the real-time tweets for you to do what you need to do. Um, this is one of the final charts I'll show you. I mean, what can I say? This is the true flash crash symmetry. This chart, you guys should really screenshot it, print it, and just put it as a poster. That's serious. It's one of my favorite charts. When markets crash like this, intraday, 100 points, 200 points, I showed you the pattern symmetry going back to the month of April that started here. What happens on the reflex bounces? These things are there to completely keep most RET, retail emotional traders, in the doghouse. I shouldn't say dogs, but I love dogs. I have three dogs. so. But let's say in the, in, in the poor house, constantly. Because that's their job, to keep retail emotional traders in the poor house, in the dungeon, scared all the time. And if you don't think you're a victim of that, then you're lying to yourself. Okay, so I showed this flash crash symmetry, and this is where we are right now. You can't make these things up. Some people talk about performance like, well, what's your performance? Well, my frigging performance is shown through my charts and my trade alerts. Go through my real-time feed, you'll see my performance. I don't need to put on a table. If I put a performance table in between the couple of losses that we take, and a lot of the losses that were taken by individual traders are their own fault because they didn't manage their trades right. It's not their, completely their fault because the volatility algos do force them to do that. But more importantly is the demons in their head because they're constantly chasing prices. So please, but if I put performance table on, on my thing, which I will soon, it's gonna be mind boggling overall because performance is based on the aggregate of all trade alerts that are put out there. So this is, this is the visual representation of what happened. So in the meantime, so in the meantime, this is where we are. Futures are down about three points, um, and we could very easily come back and retest this. So this is a 15-minute chart. Here's your channel. Here's your flash crash. So let's say Goldman comes bad, and we get another flash crash. So this will be blood red. Everyone's going to be freaking out. And you don't need to basically put your whole book on Goldman. Whoever bought the Goldman, I did. Buy one or two calls. Because if the stock is up six, seven bucks, you're looking like a hero. So this could be this could be that uh, the red, uh, uh, the blood red zone right there, and it'll be another flash crash scenario. So what what happens? That change the whole world? No. It's most probably going to be here, then a bounce. Or if it breaks below, it bounces from here, which is exact pattern symmetry. This is where the big rally started. Look at that. There at 3.15 in the morning on the 12th on Friday in the Globex markets. So can it do that? Sure. I'd be an excited buyer at that level, depending on multiple technicals, and I'll be alerting. And many of you will be very, very excited, you know, scared, terrified traders not taking advantage of it. So that's pretty much it. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to basically share things which are the reality of trading. Uh, this is your daily chart of S&P 500. Like I said, no technical damage detected whatsoever. This was a 100, 200 point drop in the market. No technical damage detected. 
stochastics, the simplest thing, simplest thing. You can just, what's so hard to read a stochastic? It's moving nicely higher in the overbought zone and moving sideways. You start getting like this, that's when you start getting worried, when you break down and you get multiple down days. But it's part of the bull market thesis is that those down days are sucked up and the stochastics overall uptrend remains intact. Stochastics also have uptrends and downtrends, right? What's the next one? That's your weekly. That's your daily. Um, and this is uh, uh, this is one of the charts that I haven't highlighted in the last couple of days. This is your SPX GAN fans. Look up the definition of GAN fans on, on Investopedia. So this is the actual GAN fans. These are my, my trend lines, these ones. The GAN fans are these. These are automatically transplanted when I when I when you draw the GAN fans. You know, I don't draw these lines. So this was the eight one uh, line. This one was the one I was talking about. Well, we blew past that. We blew past that here. Pull back three days later, and we are in this in these in this zone right now. So, like I said, we are getting overbought. No question about it on a short term basis, but the general uptrend is very much intact things can change and as traders we have to be flexible and accept change if technicals change i will change my mind in in nanosecond that's my job i respect the technicals those are the ultimate harbingers of what will happen so if they start turning negative on multiple fronts i'm not going to remain positive neither will i turn into a dogmatic bear but my job is to change minds depending on the technicals, but I'm not changing minds every two minutes. On that note, we have a bunch of people. Hi, Kate. Uh, we have Mike Murphy. I haven't seen you around lately. Uh, but uh, uh, any stocks that you guys want to look at, it's certainly an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, and while you guys are thinking about what to ask, let's take a look at Netflix. Now, I did discuss Netflix on the, on, on, on the Saturday uh, call or, or did i so here's netflix this was the big drop the 13 14 15 point drop right um on because of the disney disney went the other way on their investor call and here's netflix so netflix earnings are very key not to the overall tech side because netflix is not a chip company uh, netflix is a streaming company but still does does cause uh, uh pressure on the qqqs uh and the overall tech side but saying all that on the streaming side primarily so if you look at Netflix, it's in a wide band, 380. We have overall traded Netflix very successfully, 380, and the lower band is 336. We are at 351. If the stock pulls back more towards 340 tomorrow, then that would be, in my opinion, a very strategic buying opportunity ahead of earnings. You don't need to go nuts. You can buy a straddle. You can buy one call, one put. The puts, the calls are anywhere from five to seven dollars a call, and the puts are around three dollars a, a, a put. So you can do a straddle, or you can do a spread, where you can sell uh, uh, a, a a particular option series, and then use that premium to buy the calls. Uh, it's up to you. Uh, but uh, so that's the range. If it breaks below 337, the stock will go, is going to hit 300. No question about it. If it breaks above 380, the stock will hit 400. Blink of an eye. I personally don't think, fundamentally speaking, the Disney new streaming service at seven bucks an hour comes close to Netflix. Okay, because Netflix's content is way out there. But at the same time, they're spending a lot of money building that content. You know making movies and Hollywood, you know, buying Hollywood uh, theaters and stuff like that, uh, it costs a lot of money. So their expenses are going to be looked on, subscriber growth, all that stuff. Um, you and John Maynard Keynes, when the facts change, I changed my mind. Okay. All right. Thank you. You want to compare me to John Maynard Keynes. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Yep. In life, when the facts change, you change your mind. That's Donald Trump. When things change, you change. Right? You don't stay rigid. Things change. You got to adapt. Uh, no stocks anyone wants to see? Then I'm going to show you one of my favorites, which we are playing and very successfully, Avago. This is, as I mentioned earlier, is what technically probably one of the most powerful um, uh, long-term setups that I've seen in a while. 
uh, you have a, and I'm going to do some broad sweeps. There was a big trading range between two, 270 and 200, okay, since last year. The stock traded large swings throughout the way. Broke out of it in beginning of this year. Earnings, we played it. It broke out. Then it stayed around 300, created the bull flag. Now it's really a breakaway gap. So at this point, uh, short-term price targets are 320 to 330. Longer-term price targets in Avago. And remember, this is one of the leaders in 5G technology chips for cell phones and the major Apple supplier. And Apple is definitely going to come up with a 5G phone, I'll tell you that. Then you're looking at 350, 360. Calls are, calls are uh, cheap. They're not like Amazon calls where you have to buy, you know, arm and a leg to buy them. Um, but uh, but they are. This, this is a good looking chart. Technically, it's a it's it's serious. It broke out of a range. So if you want to do the range thing uh, uh, calculation, the simplest uh, back of the uh, uh, napkin type of thing, 270, 200. That's 70 points. Add three two uh, 70 points to this range breakout. You are looking at 340. All you need is one or two stocks to really get you up there. Build your confidence. Nothing builds confidence than 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 some power trades. So no one has uh, Kate, uh, Mike Murphy, Trina. No one has any stocks they want me to look at. Look at Nvidia or Apple. Okay. Nvidia. We have traded very successfully, and Nvidia hit. It entered this gap that I'd shown when the stock was taking off from this level. It is in the gap right now. It is hitting the upper end of the gap, which is approximately around that 196 level. It hit 194. A little bit of selling. So far, looking good. There is a gap fill here from the breakdown on uh, October 22nd. That's at 228. We have a 200-day moving average looming above, which NVIDIA needs to take out if it wants its upward momentum to be intact. So the 203 level is extremely important. And I'm going to draw a set of lines here to show what NVIDIA might do. One of them is already in place. Remember, 203 is the 200-day moving average. It grows above that. There is going to be automatic, big-time buying by a lot of old fashioned managers who love stocks which break above the 200 day moving average, obviously. And they sell stocks which grow below the 200 day moving average. So, saying all that, let's get into the tactical stuff. I drew a channel here. It needs to re enter the channel over 197, 198, then you're looking at 220. If it pulls back, we have a retest at 185, 184.97. That was your breakout here, right there. So that's a possibility. So if the stock comes down to 185, that would be, I think, a terrific buying opportunity. Now, the other thing to keep in mind, which I forgot to mention on the S&P charts and such, is that the further you move away, in simplistic terms, from the moving averages, let's look at the daily, from the moving averages, right? The further you move away, that's known as standard deviation, how far you moved away from the highways. These are your highways. The moving averages are your highways that the market travels along. These, these these moving averages, these lines, the red line and the orange line, okay? The 50 and the 34. The further you move away, you get mean reversion back towards the highway. It's like you veer off the road and then you're still sober. Hopefully you're not that drunk. And then uh, uh, nobody should be drink, drive, drunk driving anyway. Uh, so the, is, is you, get, you get back on the road. So the key is, that when you on a shorter term basis, when you move away too fast, too away from the moving averages, you tend to come and retest them. So we are, but that's how I said short term, we're getting overbought because here are the moving averages, the 50 and the 34, the 20 day moving average, the five day moving average is fine. That no, normally hugs every candle. Uh, so we are not that crazy overbought, but we're getting there. Okay, we're getting there. So, um, after one more burst into the 29.20, 29.40 level, we will be overbought and you will get a pullback. So let's go back to NVIDIA. So going back to NVIDIA, um, going back to NVIDIA, this is your daily chart. I show NVIDIA multiple charts, especially the one hour versions. 
not necessarily on Thinkorswim, but on my other uh, platforms, investing.com, those are much more easier. If you're a trader, you want to use the one hour chart, you want to use the 15 minute chart with an eye on the daily. So this is your one hour chart, a 15 minute chart of Nvidia. Look at the volatility. You buy, you make some decent money, they drop the stock, no reason, no news. Then the bump up the stock, no reason, no news. Nvidia is a pure algorithmic and a retail trading stock. A lot of retail traders trade Nvidia. So they freak out, the algos take them out to the woodshed, uh, put them in the, in, in the dungeon, and then they ramp the stock up. But this is the volatility map of Nvidia, trading between 189, rounding it off, 188 and a half, 193 and a half. The trading range in Nvidia is basically plus minus five. So if you wanna trade it you know, with some calls, then if you're up three or four points, don't be chasing it, sell it. Because they're gonna drop it, you know, till they finally break out over the 200 day moving average. The move above 200 day moving average will create a massive bounce in Nvidia, probably during earnings because the earnings are probably gonna be good. Let's take a look at Apple. Apple, we have traded very successfully. My Apple charts, not the think or swim ones necessarily, but the ones from Quad have been picture perfect. So please review them on the real time Twitter feed. Apple again. This is your 15 minute day traders chart, the one that drives people nuts. Up a lot, down, move, falls, this. So if you're an active trader, you wanna use the 15 minute chart. If you wanna look, if you wanna be, if you wanna have swing setups, then you wanna look at the, uh, uh, then you wanna look at the uh, daily charts. And the daily chart of Apple is pretty significantly nice. There was this gap, said it's gonna fill the gap, it frigging filled the gap. It filled the gap and immediately pulled back. What happened? There was an analyst downgrade. Now, my charts on the other side, which I have out there on the Twitter feed, were clear on where Apple could go. And then this quick pullback happened. That's an inverted hammer. That's an inverted hammer. Look. Keep this dark. So here's your, here's your gap, right? It hit above the gap. It's not magic, all right? This is the real deal. So if you're trading Apple from here and you listen to me and you started buying Apple at these levels, then you're up a lot. It could have gone to 205, but there was an inverted hammer. Some some big shot analysts said, oh, Apple's gonna be, oh, I'll put it on a sell mode. Great. They put it on a sell mode. Apple hit, uh, Apple hit 196 and went back to 200. And this is where we are. Net, net. Net net, if you look at Apple, there has been no technical damage whatsoever on the daily. Apple's, this is Apple's real picture that you're not gonna hear from your other services and, 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 and from the media. So listen carefully before we wrap the session up. This is Apple's real picture. You got a big double top at 233. You got some, this is a head and shoulder. So that's your head. Touch your head, just kidding, all right? There's your right shoulder. Apple busted a move above the right shoulder into the gap. There's your upper left shoulder, right shoulder. Above 210, Apple's got another gap to fill. That's around 215, you can see that gap. Guys, you can see this on your screen too. Right there, right there, right there. Right there. And that is a significant shoulder because look, left shoulder, right shoulder. It hit the right shoulder immediately pull back. There was a three day pullback on Apple. And you listen to the rest of the people out there that you guys follow, whatever. They're like, oh, Apple's finished, blah, 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 blah. Okay, great. Stock goes back to about 182. All the moving averages are moving higher, the 20, the 34, the 50, lovely and then rushes higher. Hits the gap, pulls back, creates a bull flag. Apple's in a bull flag pattern right now. Look at my other charts on the channels. If this breaks out, stock's gonna go to 210. There's a gap here at 215. So let's talk about shoulders. These are important. This is the real story. Here's a head, significant. Left shoulder, right shoulder. Still in that right shoulder range. So, is it going to be, this is what head and shoulders look like, right? 
There's your neckline. The neckline's around 180. Neckline breaks 180. You can short Apple all the way down to 170 and 160. That means the market's going to be down a lot, including techs. It's not going to happen in one day. So bottom line is, I don't even know if it's going to happen. So if it's if you're looking at a shorter term, it's going to it had needs to break out and stay, it needs to consolidate during in, in this range between 190 and 194 around that level, and then break out and negate the shoulder. Then the big shoulder. I mean, this is this is also a shoulder. That that 210 comes into play. So I would say a max move on Apple would be 210 on some very optimistic stuff. If things go really good with their earnings, then it's going to fill this gap at 215. That's it. We know what the lower points are: 186, 190, moving average at 182, and these are big drops. Apple's a big component of the Dow and um, you know the overall market. So, no other stocks? Mike Murphy, you don't have a single stock in your mind that you might want me to look at? Okay. Kate? No? Okay. All right, guys. I think a lot of great information was passed on. Let's have a solid week. I've explained to you option strategies. I've explained to you trading strategies. I've explained to you in very simple terms. Keep it simple. Chart pattern strategies. What could derail the market? Let's keep our fingers crossed. Say a prayer for Goldman Sachs and Citigroup tomorrow morning before the market. Um, I'll be posting earnings. It's going to be a busy week. Have a great evening. God bless you all. Oh, UNH, UNH. Okay.